This is a review for chapters 20 and 21, and review over the Civil War. Review sheets are available in class. So as we start, um, we'll talk about European powers. European powers um, favored the Civil War in the United States because it would weaken the United States' power in the Western Hemisphere. That just makes sense. It's good for all of Europe if the United States is fighting against each other. Um, President Lincoln's decision about Fort Sumner could be characterized as kind of a middle-of-the-road solution. His uh, initial approach was just to send supplies, no ammunition, no more additional soldiers, but he just wanted to send additional food and medicine and of that nature, continue to try and negotiate a peace. Didn't work, but it was a middle of the ro middle of the road solution. Um, Confederate batteries fired on Fort Sumner when they learned that Lincoln had ordered supplies sent to the fort. That's when they decided to actually commence firing. Many Northerners were willing to allow the Southern states to leave the Union until until this attack occurred. Once the South actually attacked Fort Sumter, then most of those Northerners that were kind of moderate in their approach decided, we're going to go to war. So um, the attack on Fort Sumter changed many Northerners' attitudes because they decided that a peaceful solution of just allowing them to secede was no longer an option. They were going to go to war to preserve the Union. Lincoln pers uh, persuaded the border, border states to remain in the Union by, um, the book uses that term, using legally dubious, dubious methods. Um, one of those was kind of this um, idea of not promising, basically, that this war was about preserving the unions, that he was going to leave slavery alone. So he, he was going to allow slavery to persist or continue in the border states. But also they had, in Kentucky in particular, they had an election to decide whether these, the state of Kentucky wanted to secede or not. And he would line the people, he would line the soldiers up like in a uh, gauntlet, and he would give you a ballot. Or the, the election was organized where you would have like a green ballot and a blue ballot, or a green and a red ballot. Green was for staying with the Union, and red was for secession. And then when you went to vote, you had to walk through this whole long line of soldiers showing your card, saying, yes, I am a, a legal voter. But as you showed your registration card, it was color-coded, and so the soldiers would know that, oh, okay, this guy is against us. And so it's kind of intimidating. Um, of course, the soldiers were there just to preserve the peace, but it was very intimidating. So the book talks about that being kind of a dubious kind of a legally dubious method. Um, border states offered advantages. We talked about that. The uh, manufacturing capacities, the um, large populations, the supplies of horses and mules in Kentucky, things of that nature. nature. They also, in Kentucky in particular, had na the, the uh, access to the Ohio River and, the and then that eventually the Mississippi River. Indian tribes, we talked about. Indian tribes in the south, in Oklahoma, favored the Confederacy. And then the, Pla the, the Plains Indians in the north favored the Union, but then after the war, they were repaid by the Union Army by... Uh, being rounded up and thrown onto reservations. Some of the characteristics of Johnny Reb. Johnny Reb was, uh, your book talks about it being, um, that there's this term called jocular, and it just means that they were kind of uh, oh, emotional. They were very um, backwoods-ish. They were comfortable with a gun in their hands because they were bred to fight, they were bred to go hunting, they were that kind of thing. Very religious in the South. Um, the Northerner, the Billy Yank, was very literate in, in general, uh, intellectual, practical, efficient, those kind of things, but 
the northerner was not as religious as a southerner, which is kind of bizarre when you think about what they're actually fighting for. But the northerner was not as religious. Typically you had a northerner a little bit more atheistic. <clears throat> Twelve hardships faced, basically disease. The greatest weakness of the south was the economy, and the greatest strength of the north was the economy. Confederate soldiers experienced so much hunger during the war because of a rickety transportation system. All right, then which one are we on here? Which number? 16. The British did not try to break through the blockade because uh, they feared uh, this losing of the northern grain. So that's this King Cotton kind of a thing. King Cotton versus King Grain. And why did the South believe that the British would come to its aid? They thought that the British would need and were dependent upon the southern cotton. And then the Trent Affair. The Trent Affair was this... Um, removal of southern diplomats from this British ship during the Civil War. Diplomacy for the Union and the Confederacy was critical for both. Diplomacy for the Union and the Confederacy was critical for both sides. Southern sides were trying with their diplomacy to well, obviously get the French and the British to come to their side. Diplomacy for the North was important because they kept trying to delicately dissuade the British and the French from getting involved. 19, the significance of the commerce raiders. The commerce raiders, such as the Alabama, they were very effective. They were smaller, quicker ships that would go and uh, they became these blockade runners. They were very effective against Union shipping. The Alabama was the Confederacy's most effective commerce raider. Oh, um, Twenty. We talked about this a little bit in class, but the idea that Napoleon III is in France at the time, and he is trying to install this guy by the name of Maximilian on the Mexican throne, this is a clear violation of the Monroe Doctrine. And um, so this is why this uh, diplomacy is so delicate at the time, because we want to take a firm stand on the Monroe Doctrine, but we don't want to alienate the French so much that they might come in the, on the side of the Southerners. The French ab abandoned its attempt to control Mexico when the United States threatened to force France to leave. So it's kind of like a game of chicken. And you guys need one of these? A game of chicken, and the French kind of backed down. So we kind of made a threat, and we're going to get involved with the French if you don't remove, if you don't, you know, cease and desist in uh, Mexico, and they backed down. So the, the Napoleon and Maximilian and the French in Mexico, kind of the same issue as the Trent affair with the British, where it's kind of a sticky affair. That's why diplomacy was so important for the North. And then we have a couple of questions here on the um, issue of states' rights. Number 22, the concept of states' rights weakened the Southern cause. And this is as President Jefferson Davis, he did not exercise this arbitrary power wielded by Abraham Lincoln because the Southerners had an emphasis on states' rights. So he couldn't be as strong as Lincoln. Lincoln, as a matter of fact, even abandoned, in some cases, the Constitution when he violated the habeas corpus and so on and so forth. Okay, to fill the Army's demand for troops, the North relied on volunteers. Volunteers were the biggest way to fill the demand for troops. Eventually, they did put the draft into effect, but that was not the biggest way to fill the demand for troops. At the beginning of the war, Abraham Lincoln favored a quick military action to show the folly of secession. At the beginning of the war, Lincoln favored quick military action. 
It's one that isn't on your review sheet, apparently. <laughs> Quick military action. Now, later on, what does Lincoln favor? He, he wants this, um, this idea of the anaconda plan where you surround the South and you squeeze. And you're consistent, but it's a slow, long, drawn-out process, and it becomes mathematical. But at the very beginning, it was, let's, let's, let's uh, show the South very quickly the folly of their decision. All right, George McClellan could best be described as cautious. Case of the slows. Okay, there's a couple more here then that are not in your review sheet. You need to arrange in chronological order Bull Run, Gettysburg, Appomattox, and Antietam. Now, that's not too tough. You know, about Bull Run is first, and surrender is last. All right, we know that. So does Gettysburg come before or after Antietam? After. Okay, so you got that. Bull Run, Gettysburg... Antietam, I mean, these are the four you need to put in order. So it's Bull Run, then Antietam, then Gettysburg, then Surrender. Okay, now this is another kind of weird question when you ask. The, the Bull Run, the first Bull Run, what do you think happened to Southern enlistments after Bull Run? Does it go up or down? It goes down. It goes down because they get cocky and confident, and they don't need our help, obviously. They're winning. What happened to enlistments for the North? They increased, okay. All right, what number are we on? After campaign, after Peninsula campaign, Peninsula campaign, we start to draft, Lincoln starts to draft the Emancipation Proclamation, Confederate blockade uh, runner Merrimack, uh, Merrimack was scuttled, Scuttled, destroyed by the Southerners before the North could capture it. Um, after after halting Lee's troops at Antietam, McClellan was removed, was fired. Two major battles fought on Union soil was uh, were Gettysburg and Antietam. Battle of Antietam particularly was crucial because it prevented intervention by the British and the French. Slavery was abolished by the 13th Amendment. The um, Emancipation Proclamation, what kind of effect did it have on the Union? It strengthened the moral cause and this diplomatic position because the moral cause is strengthened the French and the British are probably not going to come in because now the war is no longer about states' rights, it's about union. Or it, it, it's no longer about preserving the union and states' rights, it's about slavery. Did the Emancipation Proclamation free the slaves in the northern states? No, no it did not. Right. Blacks were enlisted um, only after the Emancipation Proclamation was issued. The Confederacy, and did they, when did they, when did the Confederacy enlist slaves into their army? A month before the war ended. So actually at the very, very end, the South did enlist blacks as well. They just take, took slaves off the plantations and put them on the front. Well, they didn't usually give them weapons. So they're fighting to be slaves? Well, and then they are enlisted, but that could mean they're grave diggers or they're working... They're still slaves, but slaves for the army instead of... They, don't, they didn't trust them with weapons. That would not be good. Sherman's style of war was this unrestricted total war. This was a... In, it says here, this, this total war, does it shorten the war and actually saves lives? It's kind of a, a debatable question. It's a horrible thing, but because it was so horrible, it shortened the war. If it shortens the war, does it save lives? It saved lives. And I guess your book tends to think that is. 
It's it's almost like the argument when you drop the bomb on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, does it actually save Japanese lives? And if it ends the war immediately, then potentially, if it ends the war immediately, then yes, it does save lives. Because if the war lasts longer, then you have more Japanese deaths. But it's still a weird kind of math. All right, so then a couple questions here that are not on your list. Um, Robert E. Lee decided to invade North through Pennsylvania because it would deliver, he was hoping, he was hoping to deliver a decisive blow that would strengthen the Northern Peace Movement, that was Gettysburg, after Chancellorsville and, and uh, Fredericksburg, he hoped to invade the North through Pennsylvania in order to deliver this decisive blow up North to strengthen the Peace Movement up North. Battle of Gettysburg was significant because it was, this Union victory meant that the Southern cause was doomed. The Union victory at Vicksburg, Vicksburg was important because it opens up the Mississippi. Um, coupled with this victory at Gettysburg, it basically marks the inevitability of a Southern loss. What group in the North was probably the most dangerous to the North? 38. Well, yeah, the, the, the Copperheads, they were kind of called that at times. It's sympathetic to the Southern cause, but the, there were these Northern Peace Democrats. These are guys that, it's not like they wanted to help the South win. They just said, why are we fighting? If they want to leave, let them leave. We shouldn't be fighting. Northern Peace Democrats. Vallingdenham, though, he is a copperhead. Lincoln's running mate was McClellan. Oh, sorry. No, he, that was who he was running against. George McClellan. His running mate becomes president. Who's his running mate? Uh, Andrew Johnson. Who was the Democrat Party candidate in 1864? Is McClellan, 42. What Union victory, what Union battle victory was critical for Lincoln's reelection? Atlanta, the Battle of Atlanta, because then that allows Sherman to go crazy in the South. And this wave of defeatism spreads over the South. Um, so General Ulysses S. Grant's strategy in the Civil War was total war. This idea of attacking the enemy's army simultaneously and directly. Don't worry about these northern and southern flanking maneuvers. Just attack, attack, attack. Then let's line up and attack again. Because if Grant lost one man for every ten, and Lee lost one man to... No, sorry. Yeah, during the Civil War, Grant lost one man to every ten, and Lee lost one man to every five. It doesn't matter. You outnumber them so much, you still can win. Assass the assassination of Abraham Lincoln, this was a calamity for the South. This was horrible for the South. And then the Civil War had a booming effect on the northern um, economy. So the Civil War was a supreme test of American democracy, and uh, it allowed for the expansion of federal powers, especially in the area of taxation. It, 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 it allowed for... Um, the end of slavery, there's just a lot of stuff that the Civil War, uh, um, the results of the Civil War, expanding federal power and um, in, a, in a big way strengthening the federal government, thus strengthening the federal union. The northern economy emerged more prosperous than ever before. The only major industry that suffered during this war a little bit for the North was the uh, international shipping. And women in the North had lots of new opportunities because of the Civil War, not allowed or not provided for them before the Civil War. Lots of uh, new opportunities open to them, especially in the areas of industry.
that's pretty much 